Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Teresa Resick, and welcome to our webinar today. Um, and our webinar is entitled New Year, New Strategy, Why You Need to Switch from ECM to Intelligent Information Management. Very pleased that you're here with us today. AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And joining me are Kevin Crane from AIM and Chris McLaughlin from Nuxio. Nuxio is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them very much for their support. And just as we get started today, I wanted to take a few minutes to, or just a few moments to just give you some tips for participating in the webcast. By joining live, you can resize the different windows that you have in front of you. I encourage you to open up the group chat, and that's in uh, the list of icons across the bottom. And when you do that, that's your instant messenger from being able to chat with each other, but also with a few of us here at AIM. And feel free to go in there right now and just tell us where you're listening from, just so we know where in the world, are, where in the world you all are today. We we'll greatly appreciate knowing that you're out there. I encourage you to download the resources that we have for you, and that's to the right of the slide area. Uh, we have some really cool resources and links in there for you. So when you click on that, it'll open a new browser tab, and you can uh, download that or check that out after our webinar today. Please ask questions of the speakers with the Q&A feature, and ask your questions at any time you think of them, but we're going to hold them until we have a few minutes uh, towards the end of the presentation that we'll be doing some Q&A with us. Greatly appreciate if you would take the feedback survey that will launch at the end of the event today. And uh, the icon to that is also across the bottom of your screen there. And I greatly value the, your feedback and what you have to say about our speakers and, and the information that we're providing to you. So appreciate if you would take a few moments to take that survey. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's resources webinars page in just a few days. And now to introduce the speakers we have with us today, Kevin Crane is a professional writer, technology analyst, and award-winning winning podcast producer. He was named the ECM Influencer to Follow on Twitter and has listeners and readers worldwide. As AIM's content strategist, Kevin authors eBooks and infographics on a wide variety of intelligent information management and digital transformation topics. He is the producer, the host, and the voice of AIM On Air podcast. And also with us today is Chris McLaughlin, and he's Nuxio's Chief Marketing Officer and Chief Product Officer, guiding the global product and go-to-market strategy. He's responsible for all aspects of marketing, product design, and product management worldwide. Chris has over 20 years of experience in enterprise software with both small and growth stage and large global software organizations. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to Kevin Crane to begin our discussion today. Kevin? Thank you, Teresa. It's my pleasure to be here, and I appreciate uh, everyone's attention today. Uh, we're here to talk about why you need to switch from ECM to intelligent information management. We'll be joined by Chris McLaughlin in just a moment. But to me, why do we need to transition from ECM to intelligent information management? The answer is the trend towards digital transformation in business today. Digital transformation, of course, is an important topic and one that has captured the attention of executives and CIOs and information management professionals in all industries across the world. And while we might be quick to perhaps feel that digital transformation is just another passing fad, consider the fact that according to the World Economic Council, the global flow of domestic product in the world now is 51% digital. So for the first time in history, the way that companies make money is more digital than physical. And we're seeing literally a digital transformation of business. According to our own research here done at AIM, 79% of organizations feel that their organization needs to digitally transform. So really, this is a subject that everyone is paying attention to. Forbes, for example, research done by Forbes found that 81% of CEOs see digital transformation as being very strategically important. And most say that having a clear vision of how to leverage the technologies can create a competitive advantage. And that's what I'm about. This data tells me that the notion of digital transformation is no longer a buzz term. It's reality and has a very real impact and implications in terms of how organizations must operate 
in order to compete in the 21st century. Older school approaches and common perceptions of what we have typically thought of as records management and information governance are really no longer adequate. I see a new paradigm emerging that focuses on risk, but also opportunity. In other words, on government governance and strategy. But this transma transformation is made a lot more difficult because of just simply the sheer volume and growth of information that we have to manage every day. Researchers tell us that over 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are created every single day. And it's only going to grow from here. By next year, 2020, just around the corner, it's estimated that for every person, every second of every day, 1.7 megabytes of data will be created. That is a lot of data. But if you don't believe these sort of global stats, our own research at AIM tells us that our members expect the data, the amount of data coming into their organizations will grow by over four times in the next 24 months. And this is new information, not accounting for the huge amount of data and information already present in organizations today, like legacy print streams and different repositories and a host of inf information spread across the enterprise. All of this is costing us, costing organizations. According to Gartner, global spending on information technology will rise to well over $1 trillion this year. Now, to bring that back home, an average company spends somewhere between 35 to 7% of their revenue on information technology. So, for example, if you have, say, a $50 million company, you can anticipate that you'll spend about $3 million or so to manage your information every year. And of course, the more information that we must manage, the more expensive it is, and that money is going somewhere where it could be redirected to digital innovations that would bring a greater competitive advantage. So it's really about keeping pace. It, the reality is that organizations are often working simply to keep pace with, but not necessarily embrace digital transformation. Much of our time and energy is spent managing information instead of leveraging it, right? So to me, digital transformation may seem like it's a lot about technology, but the transformation that matters most is strategic. And as the currency that fuels and funds our digital transformation journey, information turns into our most valuable asset. But to truly take advantage will require that we adopt new strategies and approaches to enterprise content management or records management, whatever we'd like to call it, and a new notion of what information really means to the organization. A change in a conversation that includes governance and strategy and a recognition about the role of ECM, content management, information management, when it comes to improving organizational performance. Well, which brings me to 2020. We have a new year, a new decade, and it is a new millennium. So what do we do about all of this? Well, I have three quick New Year's resolutions for us today. And the first one is to accept that digital transformation is no longer a buzz term, it's reality. Organizations that continue to regard digital transformation as just a technology bolt-on or something that is simply for the IT department will be at risk. Another resolution is to focus on process improvement as a catalyst for change. Digital transformation demands that we automate hundreds or maybe thousands of processes. So it makes sense to use a process-based approach as a framework for our strategic design and decision-making. And finally, my last resolution for us today is modernize your infrastructure. You know, a lot of organizations are working with systems and technologies that really are last century's technologies and working with outdated legacy systems is a common roadblock to digital transformation. It can be difficult, if not impossible, to adopt modern business approaches, things like leveraging a mobile workforce or taking advantage of the cloud for scale and savings or improving business intelligence through analytics, all of those. It's difficult to move forward when your systems were designed and deployed before those developments became the norm. So I believe it's a start of a new paradigm. As we approach 2020, this new paradigm is needed and the time has come to consider both governance 
and strategy when it comes to our information and look for ways to not only protect information, but also to use it in ways that make a real difference to the performance of the organization. That to me is putting the intelligent into intelligent information management, using information to improve operational performance. So with that, I would like to welcome Chris McLaughlin from Nuxio to our discussion today. Welcome, Chris. Good morning, Kevin. It's my pleasure to be speaking with you today. Now, when it comes to transitioning from ECM to intelligent information management, of course, the first thing we think of is the technologies to help us do that. How can new technology help? Yeah, and Kevin, thanks for the question, and, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, before I dive in on technology, I do want to reemphasize the point you made, which is digital transformation is about more than just technology. It's about your mm -hmm. processes. It's about customer experience. It's about your business strategy. We are going to focus a bit on technology today, but I certainly don't want anyone to leave with the impression that this simply changing technology is, is tantamount to accomplishing digital transformation. Now, what technology can do for an organization is remove some of those roadblocks that we see in terms of our customers who are working to transform their organizations. Uh, just a quick point, as I go through here, you're going to see a set of quotes uh, or statistics that I've called out. Uh, these come from a survey that we ran in the UK with financial services organizations. We had hundreds of responses to that survey. Um, and I think they're very, very relevant to our topic of conversation today. So I thought I'd share some of those as I go through. The first is, as you look at digital transformation, and as we talk to our customers in the UK in the financial services industry, you can see that one of their major points of concern around digital transformation is this opportunity to lose customers, to have customers transition to competitive organizations. As a matter of fact, when they think about competitive organizations, what they're really looking at uh, from a digital transformation perspective is really trying to protect themselves from new challengers in their industry. One of the big things we see from a digital transformation standpoint is just that uh, there are new competitive pressures uh, and new entrants into different marketplaces. In this case, for financial services in the UK, that's big tech, that's organizations like Amazon and Google. That's also fintech organizations, challenger banks, internet banks, who focus on one area of business rather than a broad portfolio of financial services offerings. So as they face these new competitive pressures, organizations that are born digital, organizations that bring new capabilities, new technologies, it's really important to our customers they begin removing some of these roadblocks to transformation. I touched on this earlier. First and foremost, it's about digital form factors. How do I deliver products and services to mobile devices through new channels, new channels for servicing customers, new channels for acquiring customers? And particularly, how do I do that when my existing technology infrastructure was developed more than 20 years ago before digital devices, mobile devices were even in existence? The other thing that we found from our survey the average number of content silos, information silos that our customers have in their organization is nine. So one of the big challenges that we see from a transformative standpoint, when you're talking about intelligent information management is how do I bridge across these silos? How do I access information that lives in a number of different systems? And as I'm accessing that information, and again, from a transformation standpoint, and we'll talk a little bit more about data and content in a moment. But when I think about how I access information, it's critical to me to really have intelligence about that information. Finding information, being able to get to it immediately becomes critical from a transformation standpoint. And in order to do that, I have to be able to apply new insight, new intelligence to existing information. We also see our customers struggling with new information types. If you think about, and we particularly see this with property and casualty insurers now, if you think about like the modern claims process, if you get into an automobile accident today, it's no longer about documents and scanned images and police reports, accident reports. It's about photos. It's about video. When we engage with customers now, we need to anticipate that the type of information that they're going to exchange with us is completely different. And we need to have systems that will support these new types of information inside their organization. 
And then finally, you touched on governance and you touched on security earlier, and I think this is critical from a transformation standpoint. When we have legislation like GDPR uh, in the United States, when we look at the California Consumer Protection Act, which is very similar to GDPR, we have to think about information differently, how we leverage that information, how we exchange information with customers, how we manage that information inside the organization. So as you look at technology, we can begin to knock down some of these challenges that we see in organizations. The other benefit we see from technology, and I failed completely on this slide, um, because probably the most important benefit that we see from new technology when we talk about transformation is around the customer experience. Organizations that can better leverage the information they have about customers can deliver a superior customer service. And when we talk about digital transformation, we talk about organizations who are excelling in a digital environment. We talk about organizations that deliver superior customer experiences. So number one, customer experience. Number two, time to market. The other key point of differentiation in a digital era is all about how quickly can I deliver new products and services. Innovation is rampant and we have to be able to bring new capabilities to our customers, to the marketplace as quickly as possible. Cloud, we touched on, obviously very important to our customers to be able to begin to move some of their legacy information as well as new information into cloud environments. And I want to emphasize here, that's as much cloud as you need, right? That doesn't necessarily mean it has to live on Amazon or Google or it has to be managed by a third-party vendor. It means that organizations need to be able to have this kind of ability to leverage whatever cloud technology brings the most advantage to their organization, and perhaps even operate in hybrid environments where they store information locally, but leverage cloud services to do what they need to do. Now, the other thing I thought was interesting in your comments, Kevin, was you talked about the growth of content. And one of the things that we see with our customers, and I'll give a great example of a pilot that we're going through right now, is the need to manage uh, content and information at a scale that they have not considered before. So one of our customers, we talked about customer experience, right now is going through a pilot where they are looking at how they capture every communication, every interaction with their customers and make that information instantly available to their customer service representatives. Now they're one of the top five property and casualty insurers in the world. Uh, and in order to do this, they need to be able to ingest and manage over 250 million new uh, forms of information into their repository every month. So if you think about this organization historically, we're talking about an organization that over 20 years has about 10 billion objects under management. As we move forward, they'll eclipse that scale in the next three years as they begin to bring more and more information in this environment and make that information immediately accessible to their customer service representatives so they can deliver that superior service. The final thing we see from a benefit standpoint, and I think that this is important, it's probably not the reason for transformation, but it is certainly an added benefit for organizations that are spending a lot of money supporting legacy systems is that as you begin to adopt new technologies, you can reduce your dependency on these multiple siloed systems and the corresponding cost of managing and operating those systems. So Chris, you're really hitting on some of the points that I'm making about being competitive in 2020. You're talking about customer experience, time to market, those kinds of metrics are what will measure success coming forward. But yet, at the same time, you mentioned uh, average company has nine different silos of information. That's a, it's amazing to me. Um, and all a bunch of new different kinds of information to manage. So do you see intelligent information management and content services and all of the technologies helping us or actually hindering the way we manage information? Um, so you're going to probably get a couple answers from me today that are a little bit of, of both. Uh, okay. And we'll talk a little bit more about, you know, kind of the difference between intelligent information management and enterprise content management in a moment. Um, but what I did want to do is spend a little bit of time just talking about how we can bring some of these new capabilities to bear to begin to address these challenges. Um, so before I get started, uh, just very, very simply on this, Kevin, I want to talk about information. 
uh, and information being data and content. Now, typically people kind of say, hey, information, uh, we've got structured data, things that lives in rows, columns, databases, applications, and then we've got content, which is kind of that unstructured information. Uh, and, and, you know, we need to be able to manage both types. Um, it's not really what I'm talking about here. Um, what I'm talking about here, and particularly for organizations that we work with who are really struggling with that, that, that kind of set of unstructured information, and today, whether that's images and documents or whether that's uh, videos or, or audio files or uh, social media uh, information, um, what's critical there is really being able to understand uh, the information that's contained in those uh, different types of content. And that's where data comes in. So one of the things we really focus on with our customers is how do we describe information? We typically talk about this as metadata, but in order for people to effectively manage information, right? And we talk about here, information has to be instantly accessible to the people who need it. And I add this today because I think it's really important in today's very security conscious world, particularly as we move to the cloud and have the right to access that information. And in order to make that happen, we have to have not only the right content, but the right data to describe that content. And that's gonna be really important as we talk about the impact of artificial intelligence in this space. The other thing, when we talk about instant accessibility of information, right? One, readily accessible means it has to be instantly findable. Two, we want it to be, when we deliver intelligent information, we want it to be contextual. In other words, we want to be able to present that information in the context of perhaps a customer interaction. So just being able to find a large corpus of information doesn't really help you. What we want to be able to do is deliver it when, where, and how we need to deliver it. That could be in a customer service application. That could be via a mobile app directly to a customer. So we need to think about how not only how we're finding it, but how we're delivering that information and whether we can deliver that information across any device that a customer wants to use. And then lastly, as I already touched on, the governance piece, the security piece becomes very, very important. We now have a contract with our customers to make sure that we are not exposing their information in ways that they don't want us to expose that information. And, and this is the important thing, we have to think atomically about this information. When it's time for us to delete it or when a customer wants us to get rid of it, we have to have the ability to do that. If you think about some legacy information factors like uh, print streams that uh, banks and insurers have used for years for things like statements and explana explanation of benefits, um, those are massive concatenated files that contain customer information. What happens when a customer asks to be deleted? You can't do it with those form factors. We have to rethink the way we're managing information like that. The underlying piece, and this again came out of our industry survey though, is that customers are, that our customers and employees are still spending way too much time to find information. And one of the really disappointing things to me, Kevin, having been in the space for 20 years, is that when we run these surveys and we talk about how long it takes to find information, the challenges they have in finding information, information spread across multiple systems, it's a lot of our customers are still dealing with the same challenges they were dealing with 20 years ago. So updated survey information takes almost an hour out of every day just searching for information in an organization. So if we think about that from a weekly standpoint, that's about four and a half hours a week. And when we think about that overall, that's somewhere between five and 7% of lost productivity simply because users either can't find or can't access they need to be successful in the roles they have in their organization. So if we think about information as data and content, and we think about access to information being predicated by the data that we have about that content, then one of the things we have to talk about is the promise of AI. And not just the promise, because we're seeing great examples today of how our customers are using this technology to surface new information. Fundamentally, what we expect from AI is it's going to understand content and data as well as a knowledgeable human would, but be able to do it at a scale that you just can't do by throwing bodies at existing corpuses or new uh, uh, repositories and sets of information. So when we look at AI, what do we want AI to do? 
look, these are the things that we can leverage technology for and that we can bring to bear uh, to begin to bridge some of these existing content silos to make it easier to find information. We can quickly recognize content types, what type of information it is. We can extract data from that content. We can enrich the metadata associated with that content, all critical in findability. And guys, when we think about this, you can say, hey, I've got a scan image, I've got a document, it's, it's fully text index. Why isn't that good enough? Well, yeah, text indexes, tags, are good for finding information, but they're really good for surfacing a lot of information that may be noise and not contextual or relevant to what you need. When we start looking at how we can enrich content metadata, now we can do really interesting things like drive work processes. We can do really interesting things like automatically apply governance and retention policies to information. We can even help you get rid of information that's a risk or is no longer needed to your organization. If you think about moving to the cloud, it becomes really, really important, not only what we keep and what we move to the cloud, but also what we get rid of in that process because there are direct infrastructure costs associated with keeping stuff that you don't need as well as risks to your organization. We can also do much more intelligent things with content and information. We can predict what information users need and what information they should be working with actively so we can surface information before a user even knows that they need to begin looking for it. We can look at usage patterns. So not only can we analyze and use AI to analyze the information itself, we can use it to analyze how people are using that information and through that use begin to understand the importance of that information. We can recognize patterns and connections between different documents document types, and we can even identify outlying data points. Now, I talked earlier about that use case, Kevin, of how do we begin working with video and images as part of kind of more modern uh, content-driven business processes, yes. and we talked about the PNC claims example. Here's a great example of what one of our customers is currently looking to do with that information. They can literally look at photos of accidents, use artificial intelligence to identify similar accidents. They can use artificial intelligence then to begin to uh, predict what the corresponding cost of that damage is. And they can even use, and I talked about patterns, connections, outline data points, they can even use that information to identify fraud where someone maybe is submitting the same photos of an accident that they used earlier uh, for a different fraudulent claim. So there are great examples here, not just uh, in terms of how we work with uh, documents and paper, but also how we work with images and videos to really do intelligent things with artificial intelligence. And you see here from our industry survey, more than two thirds of our respondents here believe that AI has the potential to uh, transform a number of different financial services practices. And then the same percentage basically, 64%, also are looking at AI as a way to automate mundane back office processes and in doing so freeing up time to do more interesting and valuable work for the organization. So our customers, we see potential, uh, massive potential when it comes to AI. Now, the other thing I like to talk about with AI is, look, a lot of different uh, generic cloud services exist out there. You've got Amazon Comprehend, you've got Google Vision, we can look at documents, we can look at images, other things, and, and, and perform some really interesting analysis here. Um, just a simple point I make here. When you look at generic cloud services, you get generic data. And I usually use an F-150 uh, Ford in this example, but because we have a European audience, I picked an Aston Martin. All I right. actually loaded this uh, image. It's an Aston Martin Vantage into uh, Google Cloud uh, Vision API service. And you see a series of tags or values I get back here. Um, a lot of them aren't very helpful. Yes, it's a land vehicle. Yes, it's a car. Uh, yes, it's a coupe, uh, a performance car, an executive car. It's actually not an Aston Martin Vanquish, so it was a little bit inaccurate there. It is certainly not a midsize car or a sedan. So the point I like to make about generic cloud services is you tend to get very generic data back. Um, fascinating what the technology can do, but what we encourage customers to think about is how they can work with custom models, models that are aligned to their business 
to get greater vis business value. So if I am an organization, if I'm Aston Martin, and I want to uh, look at this image, what do I want to know? I want to know that it is uh, Aston Martin. I want to have the correct model designation that it's Advantage. Uh, I want to know the color, not just that it's silver, but if it's hammerhead silver in my color uh, scheme. I might want to know something about the setting that it's depicted in. If I were using this, for example, for a marketing campaign, and I wanted to quickly find it. The point here is not that that AI and, and custom models can, can surface valuable information about images. It's that custom models can surface valuable information uh, and data about all of your information. And that by training and working with uh, models that are trained on your own data, you'll get much more valuable insights back to your business. Now, we talked about intelligent information management. We talked about AI um, into this equation. When we talk about content and these new modern content types, we need to talk about content services platforms. Pulled a simple uh, uh, explanation from Gartner here about what is a content services platform. And in a second, we'll talk about the difference with ECM. But the critical thing here is you've got content-focused services, repositories, APIs, solutions, and business processing tools, and we support digital transformation. Now, I crossed out the word integrated here uh, simply because I don't know what an integrated platform is. My one point of disagreement with Gartner there, uh, a platform is a platform. It shouldn't have to be integrated. But the critical thing here, and as we talked about those characteristics earlier, they integrate with external non-native repositories. So how do we bridge across silos? web, desktop, mobile app interfaces, so how do we deliver to digital form factors? And then finally, that as much cloud as you need that we talked about earlier. Can we deliver it on premises, in hosted services, or in the cloud as a SaaS or PaaS service? So new technologies in this marketplace, whether it's AI, content services, platforms, thinking about how we combine data and content, when we put it all together, we get intelligent information management, bridging across silos, on the cloud, digital delivery, supporting both legacy and modern content types with effective governance and security, and that ability to intelligently enrich content. You put all that together, you have an intelligent information management approach. And the bottom line for that is about being able to accurately deliver information to the people who need it, whether it's users, customers, employees, partners, anytime, anywhere, uh, and across any number of different business applications. Well, Chris, as you're talking, it occurs to me that many organizations may be feeling somewhat behind the curve in terms of their ability to capitalize on digital transformation. Um, how can we make better use of the the systems and uh, the infrastructure that we have already on hand? Well, uh, I hope we didn't get ourselves ahead of ourselves there a little bit, Kevin. But um, let me tie all the, I, I can tie all of that together. Okay. Um, so, uh, one, a lot of our customers have uh, enterprise content management technologies. A lot of customers have multiple enterprise content management technologies. Challenge we have there, and like I said earlier, uh, 20, uh, uh, literally 20 years of this, and people are still running the same systems with the same challenges. So what we really need to do is, is think about how we can move forward from those systems, incorporate uh, content services systems into the mix, uh, and really look at how we can leverage those technologies together to move forward and enable transformation without forcing kind of a wholesale rip and replace. And this is the biggest challenge we see with our financial services customers um, in these industries is they're faced with the daunting task of how do I get off of these systems? Or I'm faced with vendors who are telling me I have to move everything at once. So for this, we talk about taking a much more rational approach. Um, we talk about bridging across information silos and that's the connect aspect of this. One of the key things about content services technologies and an intelligent information management approach is, hey, it's not about lift and shift or rip and replace. It's let's think rationally about how we want to move these different applications. And 
Some need to stay where they are, some need to move immediately, and some we need to move over time, but we need to have access to this information. So we want to connect to existing data and content sources inside the organization. And then over time, we want to think about how we consolidate those existing legacy systems onto a new platform. But the real benefit here when you think about this approach is one, with a connect strategy, you can immediately integrate multiple repositories. You don't have to move them. You can access the information where it exists. We can leverage AI to enrich that information. And what this enables us to do is get immediate return on investment and then quickly establish a modern content management foundation for the organization. Get that modernization in place immediately, begin building new apps and services on that foundation. And then as we think about it over time, we begin to consolidate some of those existing systems, move them across, and in the process, reduce that reliance on those legacy systems, begin to uh, decrease total cost of ownership, move information into the cloud, and really at the end of that journey, over time, a rational approach, have a future-proof uh, intelligent information management platform. Now, Chris, I always like to ask, how do I do it? Can you give us an example of an organization that has been successful in using intelligent information management? And how did they do it? Absolutely. Uh, so uh, the one we like to talk about, and a great example uh, for our European customers is Santander, uh, top five global bank. I think they have over 100 million customers worldwide, 14,000 branches. And this is actually Santander in the UK. Uh, that we're talking about here. Um, and, and really what I like to focus on here is the future-proof piece. So when we look at the use case for Santander, they were an organization that had over two and a half billion objects. So again, we talked about massive scale earlier. Uh, these documents and information were spread across a number of different locations and systems. Here it says replace legacy ECM system. It's actually seven uh, separate systems on one technology that they needed to bring together. They were struggling to uh, respond to GDPR mandates uh, inside of their organization. They had actually gone down a path, and we see this sometimes with customers, where they began to look at Hadoop, MongoDB, thought, hey, I'm going to go out and build this myself, uh, and, and had spent about a year working on this. Uh, we were able to come in and show them a platform that already made use of a lot of those modern cloud-friendly technologies uh, and gave them all the core content and process management capabilities they needed. So they abandoned that homegrown approach. And then this is a very fast-growing bank that is competing in a very competitive industry. Um, so not only did they have a massive amount of existing content and information they needed to manage, but their rapid growth was creating a bunch of new information they had to deal with as an organization. So to that, we wanted to move those documents across to the uh, Nuxio platform and give them a foundation uh, for modernization and modern service. The first use case here was around uh, customer service and that customer experience, giving them a single platform and repository of information that they could serve directly into their customer service systems. So if we go back to the original requirements, it's about being able to give them an open platform that enables that customer experience by giving them comprehensive access to information. And the critical thing here, when you think about the benefits, not the technology, but it is literally being able to take millions of dollars of operating costs out of the organization be able to support that customer service initiative, but also be able to do direct to customer delivery of information via mobile apps. So that new mobile app for personalized statement delivery inside their organization, be able to respond to those compliance mandates. So now with GDPR, they've been able to burst out the information they have about customers. And when they have subject access requests, in other words, I want to remove my personal information, they can do it at an atomic level. This was actually the first customer where we saw that challenge of being able to separate out information that's contained in these large files, be able to effectively manage and ultimately delete that information when a customer has. But when we talk about future proofing a financial services information, what Santander really wanted 
was a modern platform that gave them the foundation for their ongoing digital transformation efforts. They wanted to adopt an agile DevOps approach to how they work with information in their organization. So it's not just about this initial customer service initiative or mobile delivery of information, but it's ultimately about having a platform that allows them to build new services, new capabilities in real time and deliver those to the market to continue to differentiate. If I have one message about digital transformation is that it's not a destination, it's a continuous journey. Well, very good. All right. That is Chris McLaughlin, Chief Product and Marketing Officer at Nuxio. Chris, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. At this point, I'd like to turn it back over to Teresa for some Q&A. Well, thank you. I just wanted to have uh, some contact information up there for, um, for Chris McLaughlin. Please feel free to reach out to him and his team that is throughout Europe here. And let me just... Uh, and also want to uh, invite you to go ahead and download the resources. Um, the, Nuxio has provided some really cool resources in there. Uh, specifically, um, we talked a little bit about Gartner, their Magic Quadrant, and so there's uh, a copy of that paper in there that, um, that, that features Nuxio and some other really cool assets and resources in there. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, I do want to get to the questions that we have here. And, um, and a couple of really good questions have come in. and. and and, and uh, Chris, let me start with you. Kevin, feel free to join in here. Um, sure. As, 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 so, Chris, someone is asking, what is the best approach for companies that are lagging behind in digital transformation? You know, is it possible to rush some of the steps? Because you, know, you mentioned early on that it is more than the technology. Um, you know, are there any shortcuts that can be taken, or just, does someone have to have to work through the, the full process on this? Your thoughts on that? Um, I don't know if it's a shortcut necessarily. I, I think ultimately from a digital transformation standpoint, technology is important, people is important, process is important. But the, the first thing that you really have to figure out from a transformation standpoint is, you know, what customer need are you responding to? Once you've, you've kind of identified, hey, this is an area that will allow me to, to better compete, better service my customers, or deliver innovative, in, uh, I can't say the word, deliver new products and services to better serve my customers. And that's what we're really talking about, right? How do we compete better? Once you've identified that, then being able to apply technology and accelerate that journey through the organization. And this is my one tip here. You gotta figure out where you're going and you gotta have a, a, a transformative destination in mind. But once you have that destination, my, my key thing for customers is stay focused. Start in that one area and really target uh, being able to deliver that first new service or that first new customer experience to your customers. So often we find customers who they get started, they have a specific destination in mind, and then they decide they want to try to transform the entire organization at once. And that's where we see uh, transformation initiatives get bogged down uh, inside of organizations. So stay very focused, have a specific destination and a, a small but achievable goal in mind. And then, like I said, it's a journey. So then begin to work on the next one and the next one, and you'll find you'll move your organization very quickly to where you want to be. Kevin, I want to direct this next question to you. I know that you get the opportunity to talk with a lot of companies and organizations and, and, and end users out there. Um, what are you, he are you hearing that are some of the most commonly seen bottlenecks uh, that, that companies have to deal with in, when it comes to embracing digital transformation? Well, sure. I think the reliance on outdated systems, legacy systems that are behind the curve is the biggest roadblock to digital transformation. You know, a lot of folks are still operating with systems that like it's 1999. And so while those systems may have a long legacy of importance to the organization and a lot of investment and time put into them, it can be difficult to move forward with some of these more modern initiatives when your infrastructure is behind the curve. So uh, getting back to one of my New Year's resolutions, I think everyone at this point in 2020 needs to stop and take a look at what systems the company is relying on, what kinds of risks those systems present not only in terms of 
things that we think about security and cost, but also will it inhibit us in moving forward? And what impact does that have on our ability to compete in 2020 and beyond? You know, other organizations are embracing digital transformation, both big and large. Large organizations that sort of have their strategic act together will be moving forward with digital transformation initiatives that will outpace their competition. And at the same time, smaller, more startup organizations, newer organizations that are coming at it from a fresh approach will be bringing a new paradigm to the way that they operate. And so it's imperative, I think, today that we stop for a moment and understand what it is that we are using today in our infrastructure, whether or not that is positioning us to be competitive moving forward and what sort of risks of that that particular infrastructure uh, can present and look to modernize where it makes sense in, in a kind of a process-based approach uh, and really start building a new paradigm with how we regard um, information management in terms of not just the risk or governance aspects of it, but also the strategic and opportunity aspects of how we work with content management systems. Yeah, you concluded with, with a, a grand thought that I've been having from listening to both of you today is that it's more than just mitigating risk. It's taking advantage of your future opportunities and, and more than just the governance um, as valuable and very helpful as that needs to be in organizations is to look at that strategy and um, mm -hmm. great points to continue to reiterate it, there. It's a mindset. It's a mindset that I'm talking about, not necessarily the technologies. Of course, there's all kinds of technologies we need to consider and work into this, but it's a mindset that I'm advocating for a new paradigm, if you will, of how we regard information and what that means to the organization in terms of its ability to compete and its ability to have us be successful in 2020 and beyond. And that certainly dovetails with Chris's comment to you know, pick one and start um, for improving the, the, the customer experience. And so that is that mindset that that is what you're seeking to, to do to improve your customer engagements. Well, I just want to take a brief moment and just let everybody know or to remind everybody um, that AIM offers a wide variety of different training opportunities. Um, we offer live instructor-led training as well as online self-paced classes on a variety of different information management topics. And we can even arrange for a, for a trainer to come to your place of business and provide a custom perspective of our instructor-led programs. And we can do this globally. Uh, uh, and we certainly have trainers based around the world. And, and this has been a very valuable program that we offer and helps organizations. Um, and it's also AIMS Certified Information Professional. And it's a certification dedicated to enhancing and promoting the profession of information management. Um, and we do have a class called the Fundamentals of Intelligent Information Management. And um, not only is it very helpful as a grand overview for all things um, IIM, it's also an excellent review to help prepare for the CIP certification exam. Um, I, I took that class myself, and it, it truly was invaluable. And it, it's some, it was updated earlier this year, so it definitely is taking into account uh, the latest and best practices of, of what we are talking about in our industry. And so all of this can be found at aim.org slash training. And since we are getting to the end of our webinar time, I just wanted to remind you we have recorded this webinar, so you can come back, listen to it again, invite your colleagues to listen to it. Uh, please download the resources. There's some awesome stuff in there for you. I uh, encourage you to take the feedback survey. I very much want to thank our underwriter, Nuxio. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM would not be able to bring you these free educational programs like our webinars. So Chris, Nuxio, thank you very much for your sponsorship and, and your company's support of the industry and being this great resource to everyone out here. And as we bring this webinar to you know, as we bring the webinar to a close, um, I want to leave everyone with our speaker's closing thoughts. And so I want to start first with Cl Chris McLaughlin from Nuxio. Your parting thoughts today. Oh, I think just to sum it up and tie into the last point that was made, um, you know, it's so easy to get into analysis paralysis on, on digital transformation uh, and would encourage everyone just to uh, embrace new technologies and begin their journey today. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Kevin Crane from Aim On Air Podcast, your closing thoughts today. Sure. Thank you, Teresa. As I mentioned earlier, it here we are in 2020. We're 20 years into the new millennium. 
So the question for me is, are we working with systems and approaches that are last millennium's technology? And if so, we need to reconsider because our competition will. It's time to consider both government governance and strategy when it comes to information and look for ways to not only protect information, but use it in ways that make a real difference to the performance of the organization. And dialogue like this, underwriters like Nuxio and others that support our effort here at AIM to broaden the discussion and bring it to our members is invaluable. And I would point to one other resource, Teresa, that uh, that is dear to my heart, and that is the AIM podcast, AIM on Air. Every other week, we have uh, an hour show, a podcast show that explores many of these topics in detail, uh, casually in, in open discussion. And I would invite everyone to check out the AIM on Air podcast if you haven't heard it already. You can find it everywhere you find your podcast today, or it's easy to find at aim.org slash podcast. And Teresa, thank you so much for having me here today. And Chris, thank you for your support. Thank you. And thank everyone for joining us. Um, I look forward to seeing you in the new year and have a really good afternoon.